let's get started with month one, which is, I think, one of the most important components of the whole program. It's where we got the name of the program, Pound of Cure, comes from your first task, which is to eat one pound of vegetables every day or more. And I've talked to patients about this at this point countless times, and I'm not su never surprised when everybody's eyes get real big and they look at me like, whoa, a pound of vegetables, that sounds like such an enormous amount of vegetables. But what you'll find when you get into it is it's actually a very reasonable thing to do. And without making huge adjustments to your diet, you can bring in a pound of vegetables quite easily. Now some people kind of take it very literally and do cal uh, carrots and celery and put it on a scale and kind of weigh it out and just eat the same carrots and celery every day in addition to the way they were eating, which is okay, it's a good way to get started, but I really like for this month to be an exploration of vegetables, of different types, of different ways of preparing them. There's so much variation and so much that you can do with vegetables, and they can be absolutely delicious to the point where eating a pound is a pleasure and not a chore. But really, a pound is a large salad. When I was, in the, uh, uh, when I would, uh, uh, was working in the hospital, um, I would go to the cafeteria every day and I'd get a large salad every day. And at the end, you had to weigh it so that they could determine how much to, to, to charge you for it. And I found that I easily exceeded a pound with my salad most days, more often than not. And it does take a few extra minutes to eat that large salad, but it's absolutely worth it. And I think that's a great way. You can really get it in almost in one meal at lunch with a large salad. Now, get, don't get me wrong. It's a large salad. But it's something that's it's a reasonable amount of food to eat in one sitting. Uh, a 14-inch cucumber, sliced up, broken up into two parts of the day, that's going to be a pound as well. Four tomatoes, six carrots, a small head of celery, about two-thirds of a head of broccoli. Um, all of these uh, will represent around one pound of vegetables. And if you really look at it and, and even kind of break it up, maybe two tomatoes and three carrots, you find that it's not that much food to eat to add to your diet. Um, and next time you're at the grocery store, you can take one of their scales and put a, some vegetables on the scale and kind of get a sense of your, for, your, for yourself of exactly what a pound of vegetables is. Um, really, as much as a pound is kind of a good place to start, and I do encourage people to kind of weigh, weigh it and stick to it literally, it also really is a metaphor, a metaphor for eating more vegetables than you are right now, for eating as many vegetables as you possibly can, for looking at every meal and asking yourself, how can I add more vegetables into this meal? Now, this is hardly a new concept. Our grandmothers have been telling us for, for decades that we should be eating our vegetables first. But somehow in the diet industry, this, this message has gotten lost. My goal for you is to, 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 to bring this, this excellent advice that we figured out hundreds of years ago back into our modern day and to start eating as many vegetables as you can because the more vegetables you eat, the more weight you will lose. And really, a pound is the minimum. When you hit that two pound mark, and, it, and I'll tell you, two pounds of vegetables, that's a lot of vegetables. If you're eating two pounds of vegetables a day, you're consuming them breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and in between as well. It, it takes a significant effort to get to two pounds, but it's totally possible. Um, but I don't want to tell you that's easy. A pound, not so bad. Two pounds, that, that's going to take some time to get there. Um, it's really difficult, if not impossible, to gain weight when you're eating up to two pounds of vegetables a day. So um, when we talk about vegetables, there really is a spectrum of healthfulness and of the, effect, uh, the uh, weight loss effect of vegetables. And it's all based on a, this concept we call nutrient density which is how much nutrition is there per calorie. So if we have a food that has a ton of nutrition in it, think spinach with very few calories. Spinach has an almost insignificant amount of calories in it. That is an incredibly nutrient-dense food. Let's now look at a Big Mac. Almost no nutrition in a Big Mac. A little bit of protein in the, in the beef patties, but really protein, as we're gonna talk about, is not nutrition. I want you to think vitamins and minerals when you think about um, nutrition, not protein and carbs and fat. Um, so a, a Big Mac has a tremendous number of calories 
and almost no nutrition. So very little nutrition, a lot of calories. That's a very calorie dense food. And our goal is to eat as many foods on this nutrient dense side. And in order, green leafy vegetables are the single most nutrient dense foods that there are, followed closely by solid green vegetables like broccoli or asparagus. And then non-green vegetables, think about things like cauliflower. We also have colorful starchy vegetables like beets and sweet potatoes. These actually don't count towards your pound. We're really looking for these vegetables from um, here on out. Now, it doesn't mean you can't eat colorful starchy vegetables, but it's, except, it's really easy to eat um, a pound of colorful starchy vegetables because they have a lot of weight to them. And it's not where I'd want you to start. I really want you to focus on these, these three categories of the green leafy, the green vegetables, and the non-green vegetables. Um, so now that we've kind of defined what our vegetables are, I want to re-emphasize this point of nutrient density. So this is what I call the 100 calorie snack pack of spinach. It's a one pound bag of spinach. You've, you've all seen these in the grocery store. It's a good size bag. To sit down and eat that entire pound at once would be very, very difficult. Not really something that I would recommend. Um, uh, but it proves that point. Imagine how much nutrition there is in that one pound bag of vegetables. And it's only 100 calories, so so much nutrition, so few calories. Let's compare that to the usual 100 calorie snack pack. It's, they'll, you know, the, the, they'll have those little cookies, and they're not large cookies, they're these little bite-sized cookies, and there's like five or six of them in, in your 100 calorie snack pack. And they sell that to you like it's something healthy and good to eat, um, when you could get, when it has absolutely no nutrition, when if you, if you consume 100 calories from a pound of spinach, imagine how much nutrition you're gonna get from that. So this is our 100 calorie snack pack, and it really represents the most nutrient-dense food. So beyond the usual new, uh, vitamins that we think about, like uh, vitamin D and all the B vitamins, like thiamine and folate, um, and all the other minerals that we, we talk about, I also want you to start thinking about this concept called uh, uh, phytonutrients. And phytonutrients are these really valuable compounds that are crucial to the way our biology works, um, that are only found in plants. That's the phyto component of it. And uh, the phytonutrients are always getting some attention. So here's how it goes, is that somebody does a study and says, you know, in green tea, there's some valuable compounds, or red wine was one. Um, there's all these valuable compounds, and they are really critical to lowering your blood sugar, to lowering your, blood, um, your uh, uh, cholesterol levels to lowering your blood pressure. They look and they find all these really important things, all the things we're trying to do um, in terms of improving our health. And they say, you know, if you eat this, if you drink a lot of this uh, compound in, that's found in green tea, then you're gonna have all this health benefit. So everybody was like, whoa, that's amazing. Let's try to take the extract out of this green tea and sell green tea extract and because of this study, we can claim it's going to lower your blood pressure, it's going to lower your uh, cholesterol, it's going to do all these amazing things, it's going to help you lose weight. But what we find is that when you take the phytonutrient out, when you, when you just essentially crystallize it out and, and then try to put it in a pill form or some type of supplement form, almost all of the health benefits go away. That it really is this subtle, um, the subtle way that that phytonutrient reacts with all of these other ones that are also in the food. Each food can have hundreds, if not thousands, of, of individual phytonutrients, and they all work together to help drive these effects. And it ends up that when you try to extract that compound from the food, you completely destroy any of the health benefits that it causes. There really is no substitute for eating whole foods. And these are found in vegetables more than any other category of food. Fruit is second, grains kind of a distant third. It's really fruit and vegetables where we're going to find all of these compounds. And if you start looking at whatever's showing up on the Dr. Oz show or in the popular press as some miracle compound that will cause weight loss or lower your blood pressure or whatever it is, it almost always comes from a fruit or vegetables. Raspberry ketones is a recent one that comes to mind. So I want you to start thinking about just beyond fruit, uh, beyond the vitamins and minerals that we see listed on the back of the label. I want you to also consider these phytonutrients, 
which are so critical to your health. And we find that a diet lacking in phytonutrients, which in essence is a diet lacking in fruits and vegetables, causes increased risk of dementia, diabetes, heart disease, as well as causes obesity and increased hunger. And so the question that I want to pose to you, and I think it's a fundamental concept that, that's so critically important to understand why the Pound of Cure program works and why it's different from typical calorie restriction methods, is the question I'll ask you is, is obesity a disease of eating too many calories? Or is it a disease of eating too little nutrition? Because we've described this metabolic thermostat and we all have experienced this in our lives that when we calorie restrict ourselves, our hunger increases, our metabolism slows down. It's all, the, the physiology behind this is all working. Our body has the ability to regulate its appetite and has for decades. And, and it's the reason that a lot of people are able to maintain uh, leanness even um, when they're not eating the, uh, a great diet. Some people have a better ability to do it, others not so good. But what happens is if, if you have too little nutrition, you start to develop cravings. And these cravings for food are often, because if we're not eating the fruits and vegetables that are going to satisfy these cravings, it's this, it's this uh, deficiency. And it's not just a vitamin deficiency, it's these phytonutrients. If there's something that we're looking for that may be found, say, in apples, and we continue to eat apple crisp cereal, which of course has none of the valuable phytonutrients that we're looking for, we're gonna to continue to be hungry and we're not gonna understand how to stop. I'll, uh, I'll tell you a, a really fascinating study that really crystallizes this point. And when, if you wanna look at the most important and most telling studies in nutrition, you have to go back about 50 to 60 years. The Minnesota starvation experiment, which I'll, I'll definitely do a video on later on uh, about, is a fascinating experiment that really shows us how weight loss is not just driven by a lack of calories. The study I'm gonna talk about right now, what took place in, somewhere in the 20s and 30s in Chicago, and it was run by a pediatrician. And at the time, the pediatrician was getting all kinds of, of questions from um, the, the, his patient's parents uh, uh, about all these arguments they were having with, about food and, and diet, and they were trying to get the kids to eat a certain way and the kids were fighting them and having all these difficulties about what to eat. As a parent, uh, in, you know, in 2018, I can tell you, not a lot has changed. But what this pediatrician did was he went to an orphanage right after the, the children were weaned from breast milk. So we're talking like 18 months to I think five or six years old. And he, um, as the kids were, were starting to eat nor normal food, he put together a whole platter of food of 30 or 40 different types of foods that were out there, all in a little bowl and allowed the child to kind of eat individually at his or her will and did not in any way try to promote a, a, a one food over the other or tell the child you have to eat more or less of this. They let the children pick and, and, um, and choose their, their foods. And they measured exactly what they ate and they looked at the nutritional uh, components, the, the amount, you know, is it a protein, is it a fat, is it a, a carbohydrate, and does it have certain vitamins and minerals in it, and their not, not knowledge of this at the time was fairly lacking. Um, but they, what they found, first of all, was that each child ate a relatively balanced diet, but each child ate a very different diet. And I think that's something that's really important is there's a million different ways you can a arrive at eating a healthy diet. So when we're looking at all these vegetables, find the ones that you like. Those are the ones for you. If you don't like them, leave them alone. So anyway, the fascinating component of this came when one of the children had rickets, came to the orphanage and the child had rickets. Rickets is a deficiency of vitamin D. And in the 20s and 30s, this was a real issue. Now, thankfully, with vitamin D supplements at, 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 sold basically for pennies a, a tablet, uh, and only a few tablets are necessary to, to cure this disease, it's not something that we face. Um, but at the time, it was a significant issue. Now there's one food that is particularly high in vitamin D, and it's cod liver oil. Now if you've never had cod liver oil, I think some of this may be lost on you. But for those of you who have ever tried cod liver oil, it is like sticking the head of a fish in your mouth. It is a, one of the fishiest and most unpleasant things that I have ever tasted in my entire life. And I could never in a million years imagine one of my children willingly 
taking any cod liver oil. I could get them to leave the room simply by opening the bottle. Now, what happens was that this one child with rickets, the pediatrician was smart enough and put a little cod liver oil out. Again, didn't encourage the child to take it, but just put it out. And the child willingly took and, and, and um, consumed cod liver oil without any encouragement whatsoever. And the reason was, was because this child was deficient in vitamin D and it had enough sense or what we call nutritional intelligence to understand that this cod liver oil had a lot of vitamin D in it. And so getting back to this concept of phytonutrients, what happened after the child rickets resolved, he never took any more cod liver oil because it's disgusting and he had no need for it. So what happens is when we're deficient in phytonutrients, then we continue to have hunger and cravings and want to eat more. And if we're eating um, a ton of phytonutrients, we're going to find that these cravings, these desires are going to be con controlled because it's not just vitamin D that we'll do this with, it's all of these phytonutrients that are found in fruits and vegetables. And when you give yourself a ton of nutrition through these phytonutrients, what you find is that your hunger and your cravings start to fall in line and they become much more controllable because your body is no longer searching or looking for that food to, to help its physiology function better. So really when we look at how we're gonna do this, what our long-term plan is, the pound of cure plan is about eating differently, not less. If you're hungry, you're not doing this correctly. We want to change the types of foods you eat to more fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and beans. And this month, we're really focusing on the vegetables. We'll get to all the other parts as we go. But we're going to change the way we eat. And study after study is starting to show that it's a long-term change in the types of food you eat that drives permanent weight loss, not temporary periods of calorie or fat or carbohydrate restriction. Good nutrition is your best defense against hunger and cravings. And by consuming as many phytonutrients as you possibly can, you're going to, to, to give yourself the best ability to control your hunger and cravings. So our goal as we move forward is to think about the amount of good calories we eat, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and beans, and try to maximize them. We want to weigh down this side of the scale and eat as many good calories as we can. And we want to minimize the bad calories, the processed food, the calorie-dense foods like the Big Mac and all the processed food that's out there. We want to eat very little of that. We don't have to eat none of it. We just want to eat very little of it. And, and what we find is that the antidote to eating an unhealthy meal is to turn around and then eat a really super healthy meal. As opposed to when we're thinking in terms of calorie counting and starvation, the antidote to eating a processed, low quality meal is to stop eating for the rest of the day. And when we look at what the result is of that imposed period of starvation after a, a processed meal, is, it's not going to help you in the long run with weight loss. The most nutrient dense, the best calories we can consume are vegetables. So let's kind of uh, move a, uh, to a slightly different topic and talk about the vegetable industry. I talked earlier about how we've known that vegetables are an important part of your diet for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is the age old grandma wisdom of eating our vegetables, but yet, as the diet industry and as the obesity epidemic has grown, all of a sudden, we don't hear that anymore. Where has that, that recommendation gone? We're slowly starting to, it's slowly starting to creep back, but it's been missing for a solid 25 years. And when you, when you look at that, when the science deviates so much from the conventional wisdom, there's generally only one thing that can cause that, and that's money. And what we find is that the food industry is incredibly powerful and incredibly lucrative. The vitamin industry is $11 billion a year. The diet industry is $60 plus billion a year. This is the shakes and the, the meal replacements that they send you in the mail every week and, and um, 
all of the extracts and, and powders that, that um, uh, are sold as a means to, uh, for people to lose weight. The dairy industry, 75 billion. The meat industry, 850 billion. And the grain industry, almost a trillion dollars. These are huge, huge industries. The vegetable industry is $5 billion a year. It is such a tiny, tiny industry. There is no marketing budget. There is no money to be made in vegetables. And because of that, it hasn't, th this message has been drowned out by all of the other low fat, low carb, count your calories, if you take this magic pill, uh, the, we're, the, the messages that are being that are that we're hearing and that are dominating our thoughts and ideas about weight loss. It's time for us to start looking back to the vegetable industry as the source of of our of the message that we want to hear. Now, it's unlikely that that's going to happen, but it's something that we can take up internally through social media and through other platforms to start getting this concept back out there that the vitamin the vegetable industry eating vegetables is one of the most important ways that you can lose weight and as an example of the fact that there's just no marketing out there do you remember this guy the the jolly green giant i remember him during saturday afternoon cartoons when a commercial would come on and the the jolly green giant would be there telling us uh, that we got to eat our vegetables and selling their frozen vegetables. I haven't seen a Jolly Green Giant commercial in like 25 years. Um, there's nothing out there in the vitamin in the vegetable world that's that's being marketed to people, and and I think it's important. So when it comes to eating vegetables, sometimes people think, well, do I have to get the organic ones, and do they all have to be raw? You know what? This does not have to be an incredibly difficult task. They can be fresh. They can be frozen, they can be canned, they can be cooked, they can be raw, they can be organic, they can be non-organic. It really doesn't matter. This is a battle of getting you to eat vegetables instead of potato chips, instead of granola bars, instead of processed grains, instead of lots of meat. Not us trying to, to narrow this down and make it almost impossible by restricting, say, canned vegetables because, well, I'm not sure why, because in some instances, Canning vegetables actually increases in nutrition. Tomatoes really comes to mind. By canning tomatoes, you actually make some of the lycopenes, which are these valuable phytonutrients, more bioavailable and more absorbable. So all of these options are on the table. They're all okay, and you should really use all of them. So we're going to finish by just giving you a couple of ideas about the different ways that you can add more vegetables. One of my favorite breakfasts is celery and peanut butter. Simple, quick, easy. Think toast with peanut butter on it, but instead of toast, you're using celery. And you can chop up the celery, spread some peanut butter on it. This is literally a 60 second prep um, breakfast, and it's a great thing. Something that takes a little more prep are smoothies. And I'm a huge fan of the green smoothies, and they're a great way to get the vegetables in. If you have time in the morning, fantastic. What I do is I take, I buy that big bag of spinach that I showed you earlier. And instead of sticking it in the refrigerator where it's going to get all slimy, I stick it in the freezer. And then I take that out every morning and use it to make my smoothie, along with other frozen fruit. And even I'll, I like ginger, fresh ginger in it. I chop up the ginger, put that in the freezer. And I can it's just kind of pull out the frozen spinach, pull out the frozen fruit, put a little piece of ginger in it, a little bit of water to dilute it, and boom, I'm done, ready to go. So... Um, you can make these green smoothies in the morning. They're really a great way to get a lot of nutrition in um, and, and something that I think is, is important for, for anyone who's interested in this program, really wants to dive in. Try one. And for people who are kind of freaked out by the green color, you know, add a tiny bit of baby spinach for the first one. And then over time, slowly increase that amount a little bit more. Lunch. Lunch is, I like to think that lunch should be a primarily vegetarian meal. Um, it's, uh, a lot of us just kind of have turkey on our uh, sandwich or a salad with chicken on it just because we think that's what makes it a meal. But what you'll find is that it's not at all necessary for you to stay full um, and to control your hunger. The truth is that lunchtime, it's not, you don't need a, t a huge meal at lunch to, to stay um, full as long as you ate a reasonable breakfast. Two great options at lunch are a vegetable-based soup or a large salad as I used to do in the hospital.
So snacks also, um, cut vegetables, either dipped in peanut butter, dipped in hummus, dipped in um, a tzatziki sauce that we have a recipe for. All of these options are a great snack and you can package them up. They're really easy um, to take with you and make a great choice. For dinner, roasted vegetables. This is kind of something that's gonna be a little more labor intensive. It's gonna be a lot of chopping. Um, in so, some of the other videos, we've talked about the importance of a good knife or kind of an automatic chopping device. And these things are generally not um, uh, terribly expensive and are really critical. You could make and, and chop up something like this in a relatively short amount of time with the right tools. But if you don't wanna go there, just some of these frozen vegetables. And you can take a little bit of seasoning, pre-made pre seasoning and, and season them up and then you can either roast them or steam them. Generally roasting frozen vegetables doesn't work out great, but it, it, you know, it can in some circumstances. Um, typically steaming them is better. And, and that is a great thing. Just add that into your regular dinner and make sure that you know, everybody has the option to eat six to eight ounces of vegetables at dinner. Um, trying new recipes is a super important part of this component as well. The, trying new vegetables. There's, we, we're gonna have tons of recipes for you uh, to try out. And then even beyond what we offer, going out on the internet and searching things up and trying new things and talking to people about it. My goal for you for this month is really to explore vegetables, to figure out a way you can bring them into your diet so that there's more of them and, and they're being consumed more regularly and they become a bigger part of your life. That's really all we have to do. And you'll find if you do this, you're gonna hit that pound mark every day. So that really concludes our talk about the first month. Again, a, an incredibly important month in terms of making sure that we start adding nutrition to your diet. Um, and uh, coming up next, we're gonna talk about month two where we're gonna tackle sugar, artificial sweeteners, and address the values of fruit.